Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. Sled dogs by nature want to go. Hook them up to a sled, and that's what they do. Getting them to stop and rest requires some training. I tagged along on just such a training mission. It's important that they know how to rest. And a look back at some old footage of one of the best ways I've found to fillet a pike. Running the knife along the bones and the meat and pulling up with your thumb, that's the key. Getting a little bit of pressure on there and then they'll just pop out. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. Nine oh six Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. The Upper Peninsula is home to a number of sled dog races. The UP 200, Midnight Run, Jack Pine 30, Taquamanon, Iron Line, the Copper Dog, and they draw racers from all over the country as well as internationally. And of course, from right here in the UP. I talked with some of the folks from the Mushing Club at Michigan Tech about what's involved in training for a race. So right now we're gonna check our dog's feet, which is a, uh, come here Triforce, come here Triforce. So, which is really important running sled dogs because healthy feet are important because uh, just like driving a car, you can have all the power in the world, but if you don't have good tires on there, it doesn't really translate. So to check the dog's feet, we take them, take them up like this, and we take them, and we can splay the feet. And what we're kind of looking for here is these dogs are bred to have very tight feet, so you can see his feet are pretty tightly webbed together, but what we're gonna look for actually is between his toes like this. So it's gonna be pretty hard to see, but in between his toes, we're just looking for any cuts or anything like that. And you can kind of look at the pads too, and I'll splay them and I'll kind of look to see if he has any reactions or anything like that. This dog has really nice feet, so he doesn't have any cuts in him right now. He's got two good front feet there. Then we usually take him from the back like this and just take the backs and do a pretty similar thing. Splay him right between there and look through the pads. Kind of look right in there. Kind of reading, like almost like reading a book. Just push him right open like that. And it's hard to see, but he has good feet, there's no cuts, no good examples of what we're looking for here. But usually with the dogs like this, it's usually more common that they're gonna have splits on their front feet because when they're pulling, they're really pushing off their front feet pretty heavily. And that's really where they get most of the cuts in their front feet or they get injuries in their, in their wrist to shoulder. That's usually the most common. So he's all good to go. He's not gonna need any boots or anything like that to protect him today. And this is gonna be our lead dog for today, Triforce, a nice 10 year old, Nice dog. One piece of that training includes being able to stop for a period of time to rest the dogs. And yes, they train for that. Today we're gonna go on a, a train and run, kind of in a checkpoint style like we do for races. So we're taking eight dogs, um, two older dogs and six younger dogs that haven't really got a checkpoint style uh, rest like this. So basically what that means is we're gonna run anywhere to two to three hours with eight dogs on a trail in the woods. And then we're gonna take about a three hour rest where we rest them on the gang line. Uh, we're gonna give them some food, rest them, put straw underneath them. And then after about three hours, we're gonna take off again and do another two to three hour run somewhere in that time span. So that's pretty uh, similar to the styles of races that we're trying to do with this club with Tom, like the Midnight Run and the Bear Grease 120 are kind of those style of races where you do that. So this is a great experience for the dogs because the younger dogs really need this because they don't really learn how to rest and they need that experience before they race because it's pretty important or they're gonna be stern all night. So yeah, that's pretty much the plan here today. Get some good experience on the young dogs.
Okay, so we're gonna melt down some meat for these, or thaw out some meat for them. Rest them here. We'll get them watered right away, but while the cooker is running, we're gonna give them some little snacks here. This is just ground up uh, beef. It's got a decent amount of fat. Uh, unlike us, we need sugars like glucose to work our metabolism. They use the fat, right? So this is gonna recharge them for the next run and then we'll give them some water right after this. So we went about 22 miles, which is about half of what capable of actually doing in one sitting. They're actually almost capable of more, but uh, there was a lot of technicality to this trail, a lot of ups and downs and a river crossing. And so they got a good workout in. And a lot of these dogs are younger. There's a lot of experienced dogs too, but a lot of them are pretty, pretty young. So that was a good run for them. And really what we're working on is how to recharge after a, a workout like that. So all I'm doing is heating up this water. It's an alcohol based fuel. You just pour it right in the bottom here. She got all wet. But... So we'll just kind of thaw that out. A lot of the races that we do, the dogs stay in harness and on the gang line until the race is over. But when you stop, it's important that they know how to rest. It's time to stop running, it's time to lay down and sleep in the straw. Now, maybe three of these dogs have actually done that before. So I wouldn't want to get to a race and have half my dogs not be able to rest. It'd be up and barking, waking all the other teams up and causing a bunch of chaos. And then they're not recharged for the next run. Hopefully some of the older dogs lay right down and kind of show them how it's done. These guys up front, and they know when it's time to lay down. Usually for a race, you get one bale of straw for your team and whatever else you can bring. Their coats are so dense. They've got thick undercoats mashed with these guard hairs, perfectly fine in sub-zero temperatures. We like to rest them on the gang line just because then they know they have to run again. They know it's not over. It's kind of a process, but if we're just here and we're quiet and they'll kind of get the memo and lay right down. If you're running the races like the Iditarod, you have to know how to do all this by yourself with no handlers. Races in the Midwest, some of them will qualify you for the Iditarod, but a lot of them you're uh, able to drive your truck and trailer right up to the checkpoint and have a whole fleet of handlers there to help you. Right now we're just watering them. This is just a baited water. So there's really not much meat if you actually look in there. There's really not a whole lot to it. Just a little bit of meat and fat just to give it a little flavor because you know they like to have a nice meal like that. But we don't want to give them too much because if we really, hey, no tipping buddy. If we give them too much right now, after a couple hours they'll run and they'll just have too much food in their bellies and they could definitely, they could get sick or stuff like that, right? Especially just for a shorter run like this. During a race situation, depending on the race, you might give them a little bit more than this. For example, if you're doing like the UP200, you might give them, if you're on like a five hour rest where we're only doing three to five, you might give them a full feeding or half a feeding with a little bit of dry food, maybe a little bit more meat. But just for this situation, we're just watering them because they really haven't gotten too far. Winter Force, it's all yours. All yours, buddy. 906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by Crist, your Northwoods neighborhood store. Christian and Stephen are both members of the Mushing Club at Michigan Tech, the only known collegiate mushing organization in the entire country. While the dogs rested, we had the chance to hang out by the fire and chat about the club, dogs, and mushing. We're gonna sit here for about three or four hours. We'll take back off again. Well, Steven and I run dogs with the Mushing Club at Michigan Tech. Uh, it's an organization that basically gets students into sled dogs. And we uh, base ourselves out of the Otter River Sled Dog Training Center with Tom and Sally Bauer. 
and they offer um, experiences to the club members and experiences to the general public uh, in the form of tours, uh, much like this. So they'll take you out in the woods and bed down the dogs and cook you lunch and do stuff like that. So this year has been a pretty uh, good year for the club. I know you were following us at the midnight round. I had two teams in that, and two we had three teams in the Copper Dog. Tom around the 150, and we had two teams in the 80, and a team in the 25. So it's been a pretty successful year, and uh, looking forward to the future too. You know, we're going to be doing more races, more checkpoint style races like this, and I think that's what Tom's looking to get back in the UP 200. So these are a lot of the potential dogs that he could be having on this race. So that's why it's really important for us to get out here and checkpoint style camp with them like this because. You know, a lot of them uh, need this sort of rest and get used to it because a lot of these young dogs aren't really resting when they're supposed to rest. And when it comes showtime, it's important that they do. You know, a lot of people, I think, misunderstand what these Huskies are bred to do. You know, you throw a golden retriever a ball and it goes after and runs and brings it back to you. Like, it's kind of just innately doing that, right? And these dogs innately run and that's what they're, they're bred to do. That's their purpose and they love to do it. I would argue that we actually have a deeper connection with our Huskies than uh, your average everyday person might have with their pet dog. The reason that is is because uh, we depend on each other and we rely on each other. They rely on us for food and training and we rely on them to get us to the finish line. I'd have to imagine that the same flies for like people with hunting dogs. It's all the same. They're working dogs, not pets but it doesn't mean that we treat them any less than a pet. In fact, a lot of these dogs get more attention than your average couch potato dog. We're trying to preserve a sport um, that is probably one of the most archaic forms of transportation. Uh, people have been mushing for 10,000 years Back in uh, the gold rush ages of Alaska, uh, they brought over different dogs from the lower 48 and bred them to the native Inuit huskies or wolf-like dogs that were up there and created a bigger, a little bit different looking version of the dog, same dogs that we're running today. Now we've you know, crossbred these dogs with greyhounds and German short hair pointers and other dogs um, that can, other breeds that give them the the drive and the stamina and the speed that make them good at racing, but it's still all the same concept. I'm from uh, Covington, Michigan. Grew up there, and a uh, pretty cool thing is, is uh, when I was about eight years old, I actually rode in, rode in a dog sled. And uh, you know, years later, I come here to Michigan Tech, and I'm, you know, I come out and I get involved with the club, and just because of my love of dogs and stuff like that, and talking to Tom and Sally. And uh, Tom's like, yeah, I gave a ride down there in Covington once, oh, five years ago or so. And I'm like, oh, Tom, it was more like 10. I was like, I was like, Tom, I rode in your sled when I was a kid, you know? And I, and we were talking about it and I, I was able to talk to my mom and she got some pictures of me riding in his sled. Both my sisters did too. And there's pictures of some of his old dogs and stuff like that. And so it was a pretty cool connection. So I think that was definitely one of the things, even, even as a kid, I was reading about dog sled and stuff like that. And it seemed like such a cool, cool uh, sport and stuff like that. So it was really neat that I got to come here and uh, experience the opportunity through Michigan Tech. And it's probably, it's not something I don't think I would have ever done if it wasn't for the school and the club. You know, a lot of people that haven't been on a dog sled before, um, they see the, the start of it maybe at like the Copper Dog 150 or the UP 200 where the dogs are just squealing and pounding and it's super loud and you almost need earplugs because uh, you can't, you know, because they're so loud. Um, but once you get out into the woods, it quiets right down. All you really hear is just the little clink of like the necklines and stuff like that. It quiets right down and all the dogs are just one fluid motion. And that's what's really cool about it. The first time I ever got on a dog sled, it was just like a, such a rush of adrenaline. And it's just, it's just like how Christian was talking about. It's so quiet, you know, and it's, there's all these idiosyncrasies about all the dogs you can pick out. And, um, you know, there's 63 dogs at the kennel where we are. And you know, I can kind of walk up to each dog and pet them and they're a little bit different and stuff like that, but not really too much. But when I run each of the dogs, you know, each dog is so different and has such a unique personality. It really allows you to bond with them and form a deeper connection with them. And I think just like running, being on a sled is just like a combination of athleticism for me. You know, 
uh, with managing dogs. I kind of like I like to describe to people that I'm like the gen like I'm like the coach of these dogs. You know, the dogs are the real athletes here, but they need someone to kind of use them in a way that's gonna uh, they're gonna get the most out of them. And you know, just running the dogs stuff like that. We always talk about racing and all this stuff, but for us, especially the way this club works at Michigan Tech, is racing is just an avenue for us to meet other people and connect. You know, we're not trying to win any races. We're not trying to do anything like that. We're just trying to take our dogs in a different place and meet other people and run them on different trails and connect with other mushers and show off the sport. yeah, show off the sport. You know, yeah. Nine oh six outdoors is brought to you in part by Blades Bait and Tackle, your year-round connection to fishing Beatty Knock. Years back, I spent a lot of time filming fishing shows up in Ontario, and in turn, spent a lot of time at a lodge owned by a good friend of mine, Gord McCara. We shot a video about Gord's method of filleting a pike. Over the years, the video has received a lot of great feedback, so I thought I'd share it with you. So now, we did manage to pick up a pike, a very nice pike. Um, and we're going to get into how to fillet a northern completely boneless. Um, we are out in the field, but that doesn't matter. We've got a nice little table. First thing I like to do is take off this little plate with fins on it. It just gets in the way later, so we get rid of it now. Then we come down right to the backbone. And once again, I like to separate the fillet now. It just makes two nice, even fillets. I mean, you don't have to, you can peel them apart later on, but that's the way I like to do it. Then, coming on the back, and we're going just to the top of the backbone. Making sure that we're on this side of the backbone. If we're gonna peel back the fillet off the ribs. There's the ribs right there and we're getting that fillet off right now. And we're just running the knife along those ribs, long nice strokes and pulling up on that fillet. Come to the tail, cut it off. Now that fillet has no ribs in it, but the Y bones are still in there. Now we come along the other side of the backbone. You can see how the backbone kind of reaches up into the back there. We just want to separate that on the other side, get underneath it, and we'll flip the fish over and we'll get this thing off on the other side just like we did before. Now once again, lifting up with your thumb is really important. It helps you separate that skin or the, the meat from those ribs. And you can see that when I lift this up, we have removed all of the meat off of this northern. That's just the backbone, the rib cage. There's no wasted meat when you fillet a fish this way. We'll feed the critters. Now the Y bones. First I'll get rid of this fin because it's just gonna get in our way. The Y bones live in this top back section. Now you use this lateral line as a guide and cut in on it. Kind of arbitrary where you go because now you're going to start lifting up and looking for those bones again cutting across you see how i'm lifting up don't forget folks i've done hundreds and hundreds of these and i know where they are now those bones are right there you'll get used to it now you're just once again running the knife along the bones and the meat and pulling up with your thumb that's the key getting a little bit of pressure on there and then they'll just pop out See, there's the bones, no bones. They've popped out. And then once you get them out, you can feel that there's no bones left. You just slide your knife through there and cut that off. Now that little piece, that tiny little piece is where those Y bones are. You have not wasted very much meat at all. You can see them in there actually and feel them with the knife. Let's feed them to the critters. And this is now a completely boneless northern fillet. So we'll do that again. They live right in this back top section. We'll use this lateral line here as your guide to cut in. And then we'll just come across on them. 
There they are, you can hear them. And that's them right there. If you're wondering why my knife seems to be dull, there's a nail and I just scored it when I cut that fish. <laughs> You'll notice when I'm flaying this off the skin, a trick is not to go completely sideways like this. You're going to struggle. I'm coming across it and I'm pulling the knife out. And when you pull the knife out like that, you get that slicing motion. Now I did it really fast before, but if you can see how easily and effortlessly it comes off, then you don't have to hold that skin down with a pair of pliers like some people do. You got a completely boneless flay right there. Let's cut it up into a couple pieces, missing the nail this time. Feel free to join us on Facebook or visit us at 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906 Outdoors.